This Veterans History Project um, interview uh, is interesting in that we're conducting it for a second time. Yes. And, um, we're going to change the date on there? We're going to change the date to uh, Thursday, uh, January the 8th in the year 2009. Right. Again, here at the Niles Public Library. Um, my name is Neil O'Shea, and I'm a member of the reference staff here, and I have the uh, privilege of talking once again with Mr. Kenneth Radnitzer. Um, Mr. Radnitzer was born in Oak Park, Illinois on the 7th of February in the year 1926, uh, where he still resides. Uh, he learned of our Veterans History Project through his son, who lives in Des Plaines. Uh, and his son had seen an article describing our project uh, in a newspaper article. Um, Mr. Radnitzer uh, consented to be interviewed and uh, came into us last uh, July, on July the 2nd. Um, and it's such a a great story of service in two wars uh, that in the interest of getting it, uh, the interview um, as exact as we can make it and uh, to uh, endow it with a kind of flow, um, we're, we've revised it and so we're meeting here uh, again this afternoon. So we'll begin the, uh, the interview at this time. Uh, so, Mr. Radnitzer, when did you enter uh, military service? Well, I was uh, drafted on June 20th, 1944. There were 21 of us that went down to the draft board in the city of Chicago. I had planned to go in the Navy, but there was a very aggressive Marine sergeant that needed some volunteers for the U.S. Marine Corps. Instead of going to Great Lakes Training Center near my home, four of us went to San Diego Boot Camp in California. What did your family at home think when you came back and said, I'm going in the Marines and not the Navy? They were really surprised. I had been living with my uncle and aunt for several years. My mother was deceased and my father had remarried and moved to New York. <clears throat> Being surprised about this change, they knew I was more a soldier than a sailor. Um. You were born in 1926, so you were only uh, 18 when you went into the uh, service? 18 years old in February of 1944. So had you finished uh, high school at that time? I was born in February. Uh, I uh, hadn't finished high school. I was a defer given a deferment until June. As soon as I graduated, I was supposed to report to my draft board. And uh, where you attended or where you graduated from high school is relevant also, isn't it? It's kind of interesting to the story. That seems to be the time that I started my military career. Uh, my father had asked me if I would be willing to go away to military school. I was living with my aunt and uncle, and things were not going too well there. So I thought it would be better if I accepted my father's offer. I enrolled at Northwestern Military and Naval Academy in the fall of 1942. This school was located in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. It was a change of life as I learned the di discipline of military life. The first year was a plebe year, as it is in West Point. I was homesick at first, but eventually learned and accepted this change for two years. It was really worthwhile for a teenager. It was quite a thing getting up early in the morning, taking care of your rooms, and everything had to be clean and spit and polished, and everything in that order. I had to do all these extra activities for the upperclassmen, and every day we would march to mess with the bagpipes. Something real different, but was real help. I, after a while, I, I enjoyed it. Now I go back to the school which is located in Delaville, Wisconsin. It now has been united with St. John's Military. And the school is now called St. John's Military uh, Northwestern. I'm sorry. The school is now St. John's Northwestern Military Academy. So when you 
if this is the term graduated or finished at military school, you probably expect it to be called into the service. Uh, yes, sir. I really did expect that. Yeah. Would Would you have considered going into the service if you weren't drafted, given your mil given the military character of your high school? I really don't know. I certainly never thought about it. I enjoy the discipline of the military. Many people, when they do serve their time, they usually get out right away. I wonder um, if it was easier for you to endure boot camp uh, and adjusting to um, military life in the service after having had all that previous training uh, at a military high school. Yes, it was. Uh, I served my time and came home, and I was released from the Marine Corps so I could attend college. I joined the ROTC in college and received a commission as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army Reserve, and later I served in Korea. Um, so your your boot camp for the Marines, was it, uh, was it Camp Pendleton? Uh, camp Pendleton was the advanced training in San Diego where I went to the beginning was the boot camp. And was that, uh, was that pretty tough? Well, for a young kid it was tough training. The sergeants kept us busy with force marches, full, full packs and rifles. You needed good training if you were going to in combat in the future. How did you feel about going into combat? Well, we were all young kids. We were excited and really didn't think of combat. We trained over in the islands before we found out that our destination was Okinawa. We did the best we could in our training for combat and adjusted accordingly. So, um, you were drafted on the 21st of June, 1944, and then in April of 1945, you were sent to Okinawa. Um, this was your first combat experience. Was that your first destination overseas? This was our first de destination overseas. As soon as we finished our training at Camp Pendleton, California, we joined the 1st Division Marine Division in the Solomon Islands. Later, we learned that we were trained for the invasion of the Japanese island of Okinawa. Now, um, April the 1st, 1945, that was uh, an important day in terms of the invasion of Okinawa, wasn't it? It was said that it was a, the bigger invasion than the June 6, 1944 invasion of Europe. We had many ships for this invasion. Many of the ships were hit by the kamikaze planes, and they were many casualties uh, in the U.S. Navy. After we went across the island in three days, we were sent down to the southern part of the island where most of the Japanese were holed up in the caves. When you have a lot of uh, Marines fighting alongside U.S. Army divisions, is there any difference in how the units are going to be used? Well, it depends on the tactics of the different organizations. The U.S. Army seemed to have more artillery uh, before they sent the troops ahead, where the uh, Marine Corps seemed to specialize uh, in the fact that the uh, infantry was didn't need that much artillery uh, preparation. Uh, at this time, uh, when I was uh, involved in this, I was a demolition man person, and many times we were trying to close up the caves uh, with the demolition. Uh, war is a terrible event, especially for the young soldiers. You're scared like everybody else. You see so many of your friends injured and killed, you really don't know when is your turn. You just keep praying. So you were in the uh, 1st Marine Division? Yes, that is correct. Now, when you were, when you were in combat in Okinawa, um, did you get enough sleep? 
you, you never get enough sleep when you're under the conditions of the battles and the weather and the terrain. There was a period when it rained for about two weeks and it was a challenge to try and keep dry when you were living out of a foxhole. You did the best you could because many soldiers <clears throat> didn't keep their dry socks dry when they needed them. This is important because there was a lot of uh, French foot, French, French foot when you didn't take care of your feet. Um, were there flamethrowers uh, used in Okinawa? Uh, the platoon I was in was uh, called the assault platoon. And in the assault platoon, we had flamethrowers, bazookas, and demolition personnel. The personnel then were assigned to the line companies when needed. Did the Japanese fight uh, bravely on, on Okinawa? The Japanese really did fight bravely. It was a tough job to dig them out of the cave so that we could secure the island. There were about 30,000 Japanese troops on the island. They had years to build connecting caves in the hills on the south end of the island. We lost a great deal of our soldiers and marines defeating the Japanese on this island. Toward the end of the campaign, they, when they realized they were losing, many of the Japanese committed suicide by jumping off the hills into the sea. It's somewhat similar to Iwo Jima. The Japanese soldiers were told by their leaders that they had no reinforcements, and this was their tomb. Did the um did the sustaining of so many casualties on Okinawa, uh, did, did that affect the thinking about the invasion of Japan theory? The victory, after the victory in Okinawa, I think that uh, they knew that they, in order to com defeat the Japanese, they had a plan for the invasion of Japan. And our great president, who had the opportunity to save lives by dropping the bombs on Japan saved many lives. The action saved both ours and Japanese. Thank you, Harry Truman. Um, Mr. Radnitzer, you received a medal for bravery in Okinawa, didn't you? Uh, you're correct. The U.S. Marine Corps awarded me a silver star for blowing up caves that were holding up our units. As a young kid, you do a great deal of things that are very daring. I don't remember the details. There are so many people, so many soldiers there that do such brave acts and really don't get recognized. So it's one of the fortunate ones. At that time, you had the rank of private? I was a private for 14 months. It was tough in, during World War II to make PFC in the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, now, uh, do you recall where you were stationed when the Japanese surrendered, or say when the bomb was dropped in, 19, uh, in August 1945? I was stationed in Okinawa when the Japanese surrendered. And when that occurred, uh, we knew that we had to stay in Okinawa a little longer because we didn't have enough points. And in order to get more points, they took and sent uh, the 1st Division over to China to help protect King Chiang Kai-shek from the Commons. Did you have a big celebration when you heard the good news? Well, I think we did. We were very relieved that the war was over. No more shooting the enemy, and the enemy wasn't shooting at us. Did you, um, so did you stay in touch with your family while, uh, while overseas? Well, I wrote uh, a great deal of letters to my father and and uh, a girlfriend that I had, and 
many times I would get cookies from my girlfriend and uh, also letters from my father and maybe even some types of food from my aunt and uncle. Um, did you see any famous entertainers while you were uh, overseas? Yeah, not busy. It seemed like we were too busy uh, fighting the war. Uh, the infantry does all the dangerous acts against the enemy. Sometimes we didn't have time to go to the rear and see all that entertainment. Um, so after Okinawa, um, you were sent to China. Yes, we were sent to China to take and fulfill our point category. And there we, we uh, entered, we was sent to Peking, China, where King Chai-sik had his headquarters. Our unit was located in the Austrian embassy in, in that town. We collected all the weapons from the surrendering Japanese, and we were there protecting Chiang Kai-shek until about May of 1946. Did you find the Japanese people uh, interesting and pleasant? Yes, the, many of the families would invite us out to their homes for meals. We would go out, be able to go out and shop in the stores when we were off duty. Later, when I became sergeant of Toon, uh, while I was there, but I never got promoted because uh, they wanted me to sign over for another four years in the U.S. Marine Corps. They wanted you to extend your uh, tour of duty, right? Yes, they wanted me to retire the... Yes, they wanted me to stay in the, in the U.S. Marine Corps, but I wanted to uh, go back to school and get a degree. It was a good thing I stayed in the... I, I didn't stay in the Marine Corps because several years later, all the U.S. Marine Corps Reserves are called up for the Korean War, and they ended up in the northern Korea, where we lost so many soldiers and Marines. So, um, you graciously uh, declined the promotion. Yes, I thought it was more important that I return home and go back to school. So, you were then uh, sent home from China by ship so that you could get uh, discharged from the service? Yes, they finally sent me <coughs> back to the Great Lakes Training Center after a long trip uh, through the Pacific to Hawaii to California. And there at the Great Lakes I got my discharge from the Marine Corps. So um, was it difficult readjusting to uh, civilian life? No, I had the experience of being away from home for two years when I was at military school, so I think I adjusted very well, to, you know, after going through all that uh, military service in, in the islands. So, you used the GI Bill at that time? Yes, I did. It was a great opportunity to get a good start on my education. And. Uh, you chose to go to which school? I went down to the University of Miami for a year and got uh, basic credits. And then uh, the last three years, I went to Knox College in uh, Galesburg, Illinois. So um, did you major in history? I didn't major in history to begin with uh, and because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. but. Uh, I finally decided that finance was my field, and I uh, took uh, many accounting courses while I was at the school. And then, um, when did you go to work? Well, before I was called back in the Army, I worked at the Harris Trust and Savings Bank in Chicago. And when I came back from the Marine Corps, they took me back there, and I worked there for a while uh, at the same bank.
So you. Um, so how was it that you wound up back in uh, another hot spot in Korea? Well, I went to school at uh, Knox College, and when I graduated from there uh, in 1950, I had enrolled in the ROTC program there, uh, and uh, I graduated uh, with my degree and also as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army. When I graduated, graduated from Knox with a BHB, I was <coughs> a officer in the U.S. Army Reserve. I worked for t three months, and then after that, when I was called up, I was sent to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, near St. Louis for training. So when you were called up, that was in the Army, not the Marines. I was called up in the U.S. Army and I was sent down to Fort Leonard Wood to train all the soldiers for their service to, in Korea, for their service that they were going to go to Korea eventually. So um, you were training troops because of your own experience? Yes, the lieutenants were the instructors with uh, capable sergeants and we trained these new recruits. So then, um, how did you get to Korea? By airplane, or...? Well, at that time, all the troops were going to uh, Japan first by boat, and we received some training in Japan, and then we were assigned to our respective divis infantry divisions in Korea. Did you come in at uh, Pusan, Korea? Yes, I believe that was a port that was open then. Then we were sent up to the 38th parallel by train. I joined Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 31st Infantry of the 7th Infantry Division. It had just returned from Northern Korea and was now taking replacements. Was, was, was this near the, um, the Iron Triangle in Korea? Yes, this was near the at the 38th parallel. And we were there for a number of months keeping the North Koreans and Chinese soldiers at bay. We were sitting on one of the many hills watching the Chinese across the broad valley. After several weeks we would go in reserve for a while to take showers and relax from the stress on the front lines. And on these front lines there was usually American division between each South Korean infantry division. It, we always had this American division on either side of the South Korean division to make sure they had uh, <coughs> that they had help from our uh, military soldiers. There were good troops. There were some good troops, and there were some weren't too reliable. So, but they uh, they helped us in many times, in many ways. So, uh, it's wintry here today. I bet it was cold up there in Korea at that time. Yes, up there in the hills, it was very cold. And uh, we had uh, good winter equipment and the troops were kept uh, warm as best as possible. Uh, many times uh, we uh, rotated from the foxholes to the rear so that they could have uh, heat and uh, uh, not get any frostbite. Now, um, you were decorated in Korea. Yes, the U.S. Army gave me a bronze star with valor for one of the patrols I was on. I'm no hero. The heroes are the soldiers, marines, and sailors that never came home. So they, they called you back in the service, and um, you spent uh, a number of months in Korea then. Yeah, when I got my commission uh, in... Uh, U.S. Army, 
Reserve, uh, June 1950, they uh, decided that they needed infantry lieutenants, and so they sent a number of us on to Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri. And uh, there we were able to take and uh, spend some time training new recruits. <clears throat> so then, um, when did you come home from Korea? I came home in uh, May or June of 1952. There must have been a big difference coming home then. It was kind of a forgotten war, right? Well, in those days, we came home on the ship and nobody recognized us with band, bands, celebration, and all kinds of, of extra activity. And it was just a time when uh, we got off the ship and they put us on the train and they finally got discharged from active duty at Fort Sheridan, Illinois. Now, um, Korea, that was the United um, Nations effort with troops from uh, many countries. Yes, it was a great effort by many nations to withstand the North Korean troops from the from, uh, from overrunning South Korea. We had Puerto Rican and Turkish troops in our area, and the Chinese were really afraid of these Turks with their long knives. The Chinese didn't like the Turks. Was it only for that reason? No, I think the Turks, Turks were, were tough and they noisy when they attacked, and it really scared the Chinese soldiers. <clears throat> At the beginning of the war, the North Koreans invaded South Korea and almost pushed the South Koreans in the sea. Truman sent American troops from Japan, and we stopped the enemy at Pusan. General MacArthur, in charge of the U.S. Army in that area, surprised the North Koreans and made a successful invasion at Incheon, in the rear of the North Koreans, which pushed the North Koreans back to the 38th parallel. And that was about the time I joined the 7th uh, Infantry Division. Um, were you frightened in both those wars? Yes, I believe that uh, if you're not scared, you know, there's something wrong with you. It's still you're, you're taken and being shot at and you're very in, in harm's way and uh, you really uh, are uh, Stressed and uh, really shook up, knowing the fact that you've got to learn to take care of yourself and uh, not uh, 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 be too much afraid. So it's um, because somebody seems to be shooting at you all the time. You never know if you're going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. In my Okinawa, my foxhole buddy was killed, and I was in a work, work party in the rear. I could have been the opposite way. I could have been in the foxhole when he was working in a work party, so you never know. So, you were never wounded? I was wounded when we were in training on the Solomon Islands, but uh, you receive no Purple Heart when you're not in a combat zone. So I got a little shrapnel in my leg and a little blood. But uh, fortunate, I received no other wounds in either of the wars. Um, you don't, do you recall any entertainers showing up in, in Korea? Or did you attend any USO shows or? I don't remember any entertainings while we were in reserve, uh, relaxing and getting cleaned up. Uh, not, at that, not at that time. Were there any um, humorous or unusual events that stand out to you from that time in, um, in Korea or Okinawa? One thing I remember was that in our squad on Okinawa, we we had individuals who were always looking for souvenirs. And this one guy that he was always going in the caves and uh, looking for souvenirs, weapons, 
uh, swords or anything out of the dead uh, uh, Japanese that were in these uh, caves. And uh, after a while, the guy smelled so bad, we, we just took and moved his tent outside the, the regular area and let him stay out there because he, he, he smelled so bad. It was something really different. The um, when you were in Japan, were you surprised to be there before you went to uh, to Korea? I think that we were surprised. Uh, there was a couple other lieutenants that we I knew that myself were assigned to uh, join, signed to go to this camp in Japan and. There we had three weeks of CBR training, and it was, I think maybe it might have saved our lives because before we got to our units, the youth army had a big drive and attack against the enemy. The CBR meant that uh, this was chemical, biological, and radiological training, and it uh, really uh, helped us to enjoy a couple, a little bit. Uh, R and R before we went to Korea. Were the um, were the Japanese people friendly to you? Well, we had great time visiting the Japanese restaurants when we received a leave from our training. Um, did you develop a taste for any Oriental foods as a result of your time in the Far East? I don't think so. We were really used to the American food. And and even uh, while we were in Japan, this is what we had most of the time, steak and eggs. How about that? Um, when you came back home the second time, were you able to go back to your, to your former job? Uh, I went back to, uh, to Harris Trust and Savings Bank, uh, where I worked before. I spent a, a number of uh, months uh, there before I took another job with a decal company selling decals and this is where I met my future wife and uh, it was a time when I, I learned how to go out and sell, sell decals. I was very fortunate during my active military service I had no real family to worry about, worry about like many of the servicemen. But uh, I, I was very uh, active to take care of myself at that time, and uh, like, this, like I say, I had no worry about uh, kids and my wife if I had been married. So um, when you came home, did you stay in contact with some of your wartime buddies, and um, were there servicemen, were these servicemen you had met in the Marine Corps or in the Army? There were uh, two lieutenants that I had spent some time with in uh, Fort Leonard Wood and Camp Kifu, Japan. And uh, when we got home, uh, when we did get home, uh, uh, we got together a little bit and uh, went to each other's homes for uh, every other year. So that uh, we got to really sit down and, and discuss the uh, many experiences we had when we were in the military. Um, are you a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars? I am a life member of the VFW, the American Legion, the Korean Veterans Association, and the ROA. That's quite a few. Uh, the um, we always ask, um, how do you think your military service or your experiences in the military affected your life? I think the military experience played an important part in my life. Uh, you learn to discipline yourself. You learn to organize your life and appreciate the many friends you have in this life. But. <clears throat> My wife says, how come you stay in the military? I tell her that I enjoyed the military because it, I think it made me a better person. 
And it was really those 30 years I spent in the, in the military was uh, really a very important part of my life. I joined the U.S. Army Reserve when I released an active duty. I stayed in for 26 years, going from lieutenant to lieutenant colonel. I enjoyed it even though I had drills once a month. And my wife had uh, total control of our three boys every time I went for the two weeks every year. And then so once a month you would have had a, a Saturday and a Sunday drill. Yes. Um, let's see, so you'd been in the ROTC at Knox College, then you were called up for Korea. When you came home, did you have an obligation to serve in the U.S. Army Reserve Program? No, I volunteered to join the U.S. Army Reserve Program. It was like a second job for me as I was now raising a family and I needed an extra source of funds. I put in my 30 years and now it helps me to get that retirement check every month. Do you think your military experiences have influenced your thinking about war or about the military in general? I believe that every citizen in this country who becomes 18 years of age should serve at least one year in the military service. President Eisenhower presented an idea similar to this when he was in office. I remember my wife saying that her father, who was raised in Sweden, had to serve in the army when he was, uh, when he was younger. He even had to get permission to leave Sweden in order to come to the USA. Should we have the requirements of, uh, of military service in the United States? Well, you, now that we are in two wars, you should start the draft and get these students and gangbangers in the cities to serve time in the military service. We should have a strong reserve, not just the volunteers from the small towns in the country. The National Guard and the U.S. Army Reserve are asking two or three tours for their personnel. It is not fair for these soldiers. As stated before, all citizens of this country should have a year or two of military training. Uh, Mr. Ragnitzer, you mentioned that your wife's father did military service in Sweden. Yes, he uh, was required to serve uh, so many years in the reserve in Sweden. And was your own father in the service? Yes, my father was in uh, in the World War One as a I believe he was an artillery officer. And did he see combat? No, he never told me. He never talked much about uh, the military. And was he in the Army? He was in the U.S. Army in Europe during World War I. Uh, may I ask, was there anybody else in your family that uh, had military service? My cousin was in the Air, United States Air Corps, but I don't know when he served. He was in after World War II. Well, we're, uh, we're coming to the end of the interview. Um, is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you would like to add to the record here? Well, uh, the military has been an important part of my life. I spent over 30 years with the military, either active or U.S. Army Reserve. I still enjoy being with fellow American Legion and veterans and foreign war members, plus I still belong to the Reserve Officers Association, active Reserve Officers Association. We used to go to Washington, D.C. and talk to our congressmen about the caring of active military and their families. Congress doesn't have many members left who have prior service in the military, and they need to be reminded that our active members in the military have to be taken care of by the U.S. government. I believe Senator McCain has a son in Iraq. Um, yes, and on the, um, on the other side of the aisle in the Senate, I think uh, Senator Webb from Virginia, he also has a son in Iraq. We like to get all our boys out of this conflict, but it has to be a slow withdrawal. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting part of the world with uh, a great deal of history. 
Yeah, and I believe that many religions are involved in these, with these countries in this area of the world. Yeah, and it comes way back. Um, and you, you saw and experienced a great deal of history being involved in two wars. In Peking, I saw the Forbidden City. And also outside of Peking, we went and saw the Great Wall of China. I wasn't uh, real happy with some of the Chinese food. Uh, when we took that train to the Great Wall, we bought some cookies and didn't agree with us. They were really too greasy. Other times when we were invited to ho families' houses to find the food wasn't spicy and it tasted better than the, the army food. Um. So did you get taller when you were in the service or put on weight or were you about the same? Um, did people recognize you when you returned home? I think I might have gotten a little heavier and taller, but I didn't change much as far as physical change. I think the only thing that uh, got larger was that my feet became wider after all the up and down in the hills in Korea. But I know I also became wiser from all the travels in the Far East. I was about 160 pounds went in the service, and I believe I felt better after all the travels with the military. I now work out several times a week, walk a great deal, ride a bike, and I have gained little work, gained little weight. I'm sorry. So, uh, do you work out on your own? I go to a health club three times a week on my own, and I try to get out other times to the week to walk or ride a bike. I'm still able to fit in my military uniform when I, uh, when I the one that I wore when I was discharged in 1977. So. Looking back at things like that, uh, decision to go to military school was important, wasn't it? Well, I really started my military career, a very important part of my life. I really didn't regret leaving civilian life and being isolated up in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, for two years. My father would visit me occasionally. Most of the time, I've had few visitors. I never came to homesick like many other cadets. I think it was those two years was worth the experience. And then uh, you enjoyed staying in the active reserve for 26 years. I enjoyed the part-time soldier role at Royal as a like part-time job along with my full-time job at the bank. Many of my friends could not understand why I didn't get out right after I was leave, released from active service. No, the retired pay helps supplement my retirement. When you were an enlisted person, you took orders. But when you got up in rank, you were the one who was giving the orders. What a change. I have three boys, and they never went into service because of the period of time when they were not of age and the draft was no more. One of my boys, <clears throat> when he was younger, wanted to join the U.S. Marine Corps when he got out of high school. as he got a great deal of flack about the service when he was in school. And Dad said, no way until you get your education, and that was it. So then, did, did any of your sons go into the military service? Nope, they all went to college, and they followed up on what they wanted to do in life. I never pushed them into military service or into a, my field of banking. Two of the boys went into the education field, and the other one became a carpenter, as he always liked to build things. They're all successful in what they're doing, and they're all married and living a happy life. Well, Mr. Redminster, thank you uh, very much for coming in a second time. Yes, it's been an interesting interview. Things that I've forgotten about were brought up and remembered. I appreciate your time in this project. I look forward to com completing this project and uh, getting a copy of the files in Washington, D.C., and also retaining the copies from myself and my family. Thank you. And, uh, and as I said, if anything comes up or some story at home, uh, 
is recalled and you want to add that to the record here, we can do that. Okay. Very good. I had, Thank you, you very much. much. Yeah, I had a little bit in there too. You know. Well, that's okay. It, you, you, gave, you gave us a few more details and it helps the, yeah, the right. spontane, oh. spontaneity of it a little yeah, bit. It, yeah, I, I felt more comfortable this time. Really? really? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. I'm doing this because, uh, you know, when you're going personal.